been a it's been a very active morning this morning. Uh, we've had everything, haven't we? Uh, children out the front singing, Easter eggs smashed all over the floor. Um, it's uh, a great joy, and uh, it's always a, a, a real highlight of my week to be here with you, and a highlight to listen to God's word and to respond in faith and obedience. But to do that, we need to pray. We need God's help. Loving Father, we pray for this, your word, now as we turn to it. We want to know the truth, Lord, and nothing but the truth, but our minds and our hearts are hardened to the truth. So we pray that you would heal us of everything that would get in the way of us understanding your purposes, your plan, through Jesus Christ, so that we may hear this and respond in faith and obedience. In his name we pray. Amen. Have you ever stumbled, coughed, or stuttered during prayer at church? You know, perhaps at church you've had to pray and you've just not been able to put a sentence together. Well, today that may be embarrassing, but in Salem during the 19th century, that could be fatal. 30 people were found guilty of witchcraft or sorcery, and 19 were executed for it. They were accused of being in league with the devil, and there were various tests to prove it, and one was the prayer test. The accused were forced to recite the Lord's Prayer, and if they could not complete it without error, then obviously they were guilty. It's okay. You'll not come to the same fate here at Oceanside Anglican Church. We, uh, we will conclude that either you are sleep deprived, distracted, or just struggled to put a sentence together on Sunday morning. It's okay. And after all, it is difficult to pronounce trespass. I mean, trespass, whatever. <laughs> So uh, watch out later, Clem, when you lead us in prayer. We'll be watching. <laughs> what happened then is they undoubtedly convicted 30 innocent people. No one would dispute that. And it shows us that injustice is not only unfair, it's dangerous. Injustice. The Salem Witch Trials are now used as an example of what not to do in a court of law. Equally, the trial of Jesus before Pilate was an example of miscarriage of justice. It is complete with trumped up charges, mob hysteria, bias and politically motivated verdicts. Yet amazingly, all of this is within God's will. Jesus stands before the powerful governor of Judea, Pilate, and the charge is treason. The Jewish leaders shout in chapter 19, anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And Pilate concludes, you are a king then. So it's not looking good for Jesus. But what type of king is Jesus? Firstly, background, and if you have your Bibles there, follow along with me, because I'm going to show you how we race from chapter 11 to chapter 18. In chapter 18, uh, in chapter 11, last week, we looked at the healing of Lazarus. And now we're at chapter 18, which is a mighty number of chapters in advance, uh, at the trial before Pilate. Next weekend is the weekend away, and following that, we'll come back here to the Gospel of John and do chapter 12, which seems a little bit of out of order. The reason that we're doing that then is because it aligns with Palm Sunday, which celebrates Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem, which is the events of John chapter 12. So that's why we'll go back. Not that John had ever heard of Palm Sunday or Easter. He was focused on a different calendar, the Jewish calendar, which is marked out by festivals. Last week, Jesus journeyed to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication, or Hanukkah, chapter 10, verse 22. 
Hanukkah celebrates the rededication of the temple, which was trashed by the Gentiles. It celebrates liberation from the Gentile enemies. And during Hanukkah, Jesus liberated Lazarus from a greater enemy, namely death. Following the raising of Lazarus, the leading Jews called a meeting to discuss what could be done with Jesus before everyone believes in him. In chapter 11, we read that they plotted to take his life. And that sent Jesus into hiding. It was not yet his time to die. And he hid out, hid out in the wilderness in a village called Ephraim until six days before Passover, another season, when Jesus returns to Bethany, Lazarus' home. We see that that happens in chapter 12, verse 1. We're now talking four months after Hanukkah. Chapter 12 covers the period of six days before the Passover. And with the arrival of Passover, Jesus knew that the time of his death was nearing, but he calls it the time of his glorification, chapter 12, verse 7. In chapter 13, Jesus enjoys a meal with his disciples. The next four chapters contain Jesus' teaching that night in the upper room. Jesus knew that he himself would be the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world and enables release from death. So half of chapter 11 equals four months, chapter 12 equals six days, and chapter 13 to 17 is one night. So Jesus, I beg your pardon, John is slowing down time and focusing on Jesus' last day, four months six days, one night, over a number of chapters. In chapter 18, Jesus is arrested and brought before the Gentile governor, Pilate. And Jesus is accused of treason and sentenced to be executed. So who was responsible? I have a, an outline here. Three points, the Jewish leaders, the will but not the authority. Pilate, the authority but not the will. And finally, Jesus, a true king, a king of truth. Firstly, the Jews, they have the will to execute Jesus, but not the authority. And they bring him to Pilate, but they'd already decided what Pilate should do with him. And we read in chapter 18, verse 31, they say, we have no right to execute anyone. So they've already decided for Pilate what the sentence should be, execution. Ironically, earlier, they'd almost achieved his death by stoning in chapter 8, but the time was not yet for him to die, so he slipped away. But now, as far as they're concerned, even a stoning is too good for, for Jesus, and they want an authorised public execution. Their verdict is guilty, and their sentence is execution, but they have no authority to do this, so they pass him on to the Gentiles. Jesus was the word of God incarnate who came to his very own people, Israel, and we read in chapter 1, yet his own did not receive him. And the conflict begins in chapter 2 when Jesus cleared the temple and the Jews challenged him, what signs can you show that show that you have authority to do this? And tensions rise over the identity of Jesus, who is he? And they take exception in when, in chapter 8, Jesus calls them children of the devil. John chapter 8, verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. I wonder what you think of when you think of Satan, someone that brings perhaps uh, pain and discomfort to people's lives. Well, Jesus says he's a murderer. How does he mur murder? With lies. And like their father, they want to murder Jesus. And like their father, they care little for the truth. Jesus is telling the truth and they are determined to stop him so they bring him, him to Pilate. Pilate has the authority to execute Jesus, but not the will. From the start, Pilate is a reluctant judge. He's ready to throw this case out of his court. Take him yourselves and judge him by your law, he says. 
But the Jews insist that treason is his concern, shouting anyone who claims to be a king is not a friend of Caesar's. So Pilate has to determine whether Jesus claims to be a king. And his conclusion is, verse 37, chapter 18, verse 37, you are a king, but he's not yet convinced that Jesus is a threat to the Roman Empire. So he concludes in verse 38, I find no basis to charge him. He tries to release him, but the crowd demand instead the release of Barabbas. We're talking about this in our growth group last Thursday night as we were studying the passage. And Anita, a member of our growth group, said, Ah, oh, Barabbas, he was an insurrectionist. Not only does this trial uh, end up convicting an innocent person, but it acquits a guilty person, an insurrectionist was a person who was guilty of treason. Jesus was punished for the crime that Barabbas committed. And Pilate tries once again to release Jesus. He hopes that the crowd will be satisfied with a good flogging and a bit of humiliation. Yet they cry, crucify him. Pilate questions Jesus one more time, but he's amazed that Jesus refuses to answer him, hoping that maybe Jesus would give him something that he could either find him guilty of or innocent of. And we read in chapter 19, verse 12, that Pilate tries to set him free again. But the crowd insist, crucify him. So Pilate is very reluctant to convict Jesus of any crime, let alone a capital offence, so is he just an innocent bystander in this whole parade? No, I don't believe he's an innocent bystander. He's guilty of deep, deep corruption. He was given authority to condemn the guilty and protect the innocent, yet for the sake of peace, he gives into the mob's demands. Pilate is a weak leader. What about Jesus? How does he compare? Jesus is a true king. I'm humbled by Jesus' dignity and true nobility through the whole hearing. He was the only one with a pure will and true authority. His will is focused on the Father. At his arrest, he refuses to resist, saying to Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This is the Jesus who turned water into wine, who healed the blind man, who brought Lazarus back to life. Surely he could escape this sham of a trial. No, he subjects himself to the will of the Father and allows himself to be arrested and trialed. This is the cup he must drink. And while the Jews and Pilate struggled in their judgment of Jesus, Jesus is ultimately and ironically the one with ultimate authority to judge. John chapter 5, verse 26, we read, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Which, of course, brings our minds back to Daniel chapter 7, where the Son of Man comes in power to judge, and the kingdom is restored to him. And Jesus' authority comes from his relationship with the Father. He is uh, one of inherent authority. The Jewish leaders and Pilate judge him, but he is the only legitimate judge. So he's the judge. Uh, then what type of king is he? Negatively, he says his kingdom is not of this world. He's not interested in overturning the Roman Empire. No, Jesus came to rule the kingdom of heaven an eternal kingdom that will never end, and a kingdom based on truth. John chapter 18, verse 37. Read those words there. Jesus answered, The reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. 
The Gospel of John doesn't include a nativity scene like Matthew and Luke does. But here we have a clear statement as to the purpose of Jesus' birth to testify to the truth. That's what he came for. The world was in, a, in darkness, subject to lies. And Jesus brings freedom. How does he bring that freedom? By bringing truth into the world. And when scriptures talk about truth, it's not so much things of academic interest, like how to build a building that won't fall down, or E equals MC squared, whatever that means, I have no idea. That's the truth of experts, and I have no chance of understanding them, let alone believing in them. But this is high-level truth that Jesus is speaking about, profound truths that we all need to know, things like who we are, and whether there's an existence beyond the temporal realm, who's in charge and what his plans are and how they impact us. It is truth that is out of reach of humans and must come from God. Yet it's, it's essential truth. How can we exist without knowing the truth about these things? Some people may think that they can never know them, but Jesus came into the world that we may know them. And the weird thing is, when Jesus made the truth known, people didn't want to hear it. They couldn't handle the truth. No one said the truth would be easy to hear. We read in John chapter 3, 19, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Ever met a person that doesn't want to hear the truth? It's too painful, too revealing, so they reject it and they refuse to budge. They're stubborn. Well, this is the verdict of the world. Light came into the world and exposed it. Jesus showed the world's failure, sinfulness and ignorance, but it's too painful. So they went back to false religion, their pageantry, their palatial living to cover up their powerlessness, their ignorance and their rebellion. They preferred the lie over the truth. The truth was too painful. The world is stubborn and resistant to the truth. And we can, we can see, we can all see that this trial is a sham. But I wonder what the participants would say if you spoke to them. If you spoke to the religious leaders and asked, why, why did you want Jesus killed? They would say, well, we have our laws, and he broke the laws, like healing on the Sabbath. He claimed to be the Messiah, but he came from Galilee. We know that the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee. He comes from Bethlehem. He told our respected leaders that they were children of Satan, our respected leaders. He blasphemed, claiming to be the Son of God. You know, we risk losing our whole religion. Or if you ask Pilate, why did you condemn an innocent man? He might say, well, I didn't want to. I found no basis for charge against him, but the crowd was shouting. I had to, to maintain peace. That was my job. And if you ask someone in the crowd, why did you shout, crucify him? They might reply, well, everyone else was. I figured that if the Jewish leaders were against him and the crowd was against him, how can so many be so wrong? These were my kindred. I wanted to belong. I had to join them. Different things blinded the different players from the truth. Yet Jesus said, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Not to these other so-called sources of information. This is how you can tell who is in his kingdom. It doesn't depend on where or when you live. It depends on whether you accept Jesus' words and claims. Where you get your truth from shows who you are. I mean, are you blinded by religion like the religious leaders were? Just yesterday at the beach, I got chatting with a lady and she told me that all religions are good. 
I said, how can that be? Can't possibly be. I disagree with her, but I had the sense she didn't want to engage. She didn't want to be budged on that one. She wasn't prepared to change her mind. Or are you a pragmatist like Pilate? You only trust what you can see, experience, and gives an immediate reward, one more day of peace. Or are you like the mob? You agree with the people that you sh who share your values, the Democrats or the Republicans. You are unprepared to stand out for the crowd for fear that they may reveal that you don't actually belong to them. Well, perhaps you think, I'm oh, none of those. I'm an individual. I think for myself as if somehow you're able to cut through the nonsense and the hysteria that the rest of the world gets caught up in. I doubt that. We don't look to religion, the powerful, the crowd, or ourselves for truth. We look to Jesus. That's how we know that we're on the side of truth, by accepting his word. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Ever heard that saying before? Know where it comes from? In 1978, over 900 people died in Jonestown, a cult settlement in a South American country in Guyana. Guyana. Most of them died by suicide by drinking Kool-Aid laced with Sinai, encouraged to drink it by their leader, Jim Jones. 900 people committed suicide. It's assumed that each person voluntarily took the cup and drank it. The Kool-Aid, which is a type of American cordial, was used to mask the bitterness of the cyanide and to make it easier to drink. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. We were horrified. How could this happen? How could people be so dumb? Why wasn't Jim Jones stopped before this happened? You'd be surprised to know that they weren't simple people. They were normal people that had just been, that accepted Jim Jones's truth. That was their truth world. So what killed them? Technically it was toxicity, but in effect it was lies and propaganda and conspiracy espoused by a loved and most dangerous leader. They were at the mercy of a madman. Such was their world. And we can see their faults because we live in a different world. But to truly understand it, you have to believe that we also are susceptible to the lies of our world. We can fall to, for the lies as well. We just have a different set of lies to fall for in this world. Don't drink the Kool-Aid of this world. But Jesus, like we are from a different world to the people in Jonestown, Jesus came from a different place, the world above, to testify to the truth. And he promised that the truth will set you free, free from deception, from slavery and eventual destruction, free from the very lies that caused his death. I was researching this passage during week and reading a commentary. I picked up commentary from the bookshelf, uh, one by Bruce Milne, on the Gospel of John. There's, there's some two copies over there if anyone wants to grab one, remembering they're all free resources for you. And I'll read this out from page 267 of the commentary of Bruce Milne. He writes, We are therefore faced with a paradoxical fact that the one perfect life our planet has witnessed, universally recognised as the epitome of goodness, love and kindness and integrity, reached its conclusion in a court facing capital charges. He who lived as the Holy One dies as the condemned one. What type of a world would condemn a man like that? Answer, a world that sides with falsehood rather than truth. A world that has drunk the Kool-Aid. Instead, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And his followers listen to him. 
He is the tr source of truth, the one that can steer our way out of a world that is blinded and is in darkness and is full of lies into a world of truth that we can see things the way God sees them, knowing who is in charge, knowing his plans and knowing how it impacts us. The truth will set us free. Loving Father, thank you for Jesus that you sent him in the world. And though it was a life that ended in such a tragic way, Lord, it was all part of your plan, your will, so that we may know the king of truth and that we may be set free from our sin and the lies and the deception of the devil and may live as a part of your eternal kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that we sit here believing in that, knowing Jesus as truly free people. And Lord, let us breathe that air of freedom as we meet together around your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're now going to respond in song, the hymn of the Saviour.